So Kristen, I want to talk about an early experience with a brand, right? You're a CMO now, right? And you're a brand expert. So what in your life very early was the first imprint of a brand that made an impact on you? Yeah, the first one that I can remember having a big impact on me was Fisher Price. And it was Fisher Price because I really wanted that little house. And I remember the day my dad just brought it home. It wasn't my birthday, it wasn't anything. He brought home that house with the little farm animals and the things that could move around and you could play make-believe. And, but yeah, and it just kind of stuck with me as a brand that meant something more than just a toy. And I think about my kids on their damn phones now and I think, go get a Fisher-Price house. <laughs> Mine was... Um, yeah, what was yours? Adidas. Really? You know why? Um... I mean, this is this is my generation. I'm a bit older than you, but Converse sneakers were the basketball shoes. And I remember when Adidas came out with their first three-stripe basketball shoe. Yeah. And some of my heroes started to wear it in the NBA, and uh, and they were thirty-two dollars versus like nine dollars at Converse. Yeah. And I had a paper route, and I shoveled snow, and I mowed lawns, and I saved up my money, went down to Shank Brothers, which is the sporting goods store downtown, and I bought my first pair, and I put them on. And I felt invincible. Yeah. When I went in the court, I thought, I, I can do anything. Who was their NBA? Who was the athlete they signed up? One of the first ones was Billy Cunningham. Yeah. And uh, for the 76ers, I grew up near Philadelphia, so I was a big Sixer fan. So he was one of the first ones who changed into uh, Adidas. Yeah. And Challenger so, brand. Yeah. yeah. Right Whereas back then it was. still in business. Was Converse still in business? But they, they yeah, make but the, now they're my much more fashion. My daughter's got one, right. Oh, Nike owns them. Now they're much more about fashion. Right. And they're, yeah, they make they, the high done, tops. They've done yeah. well, actually. And there's a next Nike guy running it now. They're in Boston, Converse. Are they? Yeah. Huh. Yep. In fact, I went there a few years ago. Big day t- in Boston yesterday. Yeah. yeah the Red Sox right. ceremony. Yeah. They stink this year, which is killing me. I saw but. your tweet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Kristen, thanks for joining. It's an honor, As guest Jim. number one on the CMO I'm so podcast. I'm so excited. <laughs> so, we're going to do introduction later, so I'm just mm-hmm. going to jump right into some things. So, Kristen, you and I are both married, mm-hmm. and we're both renovating a house. <laughs> so, what I want you to talk about- Are you about, still happily married? <laughs> absolutely, because I abrogate all decisions to the one who's much more talented to make yes. those decisions, which is my wife, Kathleen. Yeah. I know so, someone who needs to hear this podcast. Well, maybe I can. <laughs> Very good. Our first listener. Mm-hmm. So, what have you learned in this renovation process that has made you an even better CMO, Chief Marketing um, Officer? God, that is a fascinating question. I'll tell you, when, you, when you're in these jobs that you and I have been in, your time management is on a razor's edge, right? Everything is kind of down to the minute of air traffic control. And, you know, some days you feel like you've got it going on. And some days the whole thing just, like, goes to hell. Every day goes to hell now <laughs> with the kitchen <laughs> renovation process because you have to make these decisions. I was telling Lucy, who's with me on the way over, you know, we had like an epic hour and a half discussion about cabinet pulls. Um, so I think it's really forced even more rigor around time management, which is basically the key to doing this job or any job well, and how to resolve conflict very quickly. <laughs> yes. Fast decision making, right? Yes. And trust. That's right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And and for my husband and me, he stays home. I work. We've got, you know, a general division of labor. But something like this kind of throws off the whole operating model and you got to reset. So when will you be done? Never. Like most people. (laughs) The original goal was 4th of July. I think we'll be done with one room by the 4th of July and the rest may take the entire summer. So we're doing a historical home in Coronado. So we have all the constraints of a historical home. So we'll talk about that later because that's I'm using lots of my skills on influence and persuasion and storytelling. There is a real micro segment of people going through renovation that is unserved. (laughs) How to manage it. We'll start Mm -hmm. a new business there. Yeah. So... So we also both had interesting career paths leading to CMO. I wanted to be a writer when I was in college, and I started writing, and you wanted to be a writer as well. So why was that your aspiration as a younger woman, and what changed to land you the CMO of one of the most important organizations in the world? Right. which we will talk about more later. Uh, yeah, it still feels weird when people say that. 
Um, it was an unconventional path, I guess, of happy accidents. Um, I was a creative writing major. I went to a liberal arts school. I went to Vanderbilt. Love it. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm good at writing. I'll become a writer. And I believed you should do what you loved. And I think my parents thought I would be destitute forever. And then I realized you need some life experience to actually write. So I went out to work and thought I would be a journalist. And I started out at NBC in their page program that's yeah, on 30 sure. Rock. And realized I didn't want to be a journalist. I didn't want to get up at four in the morning and like chase ambulances and things. And so I ended up in the communications department. And then I kind of progressed through my career to different companies until I ended up at J.P. Morgan in 1998. So what was the big milestone that led you to J.P. Morgan Chase? I met the guy who hired me in a bar. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, it happens, it's a guy, right? he's still a good friend. His name's Joe Evangelista. He runs corporate communications at J.P. Morgan today. And our bosses were part of what's now the business roundtable. It was called something sure. else back then. And I was working for Larry Bossidy, yeah. who is the CEO of Allied Signal, and he was working for Sandy Warner. And the rule was the PR person of the person running the business roundtable at the time would run the event. He happened to come down with his CEO. I took a bunch of journalists out to a bar, invited him to come, and he asked me if I wanted a job that night. And I said, no way. I'm really happy where I am. <laughs> wow. And how many years yeah. ago was that? 21. Wow. And you've been CMO how long? Five and a half. Okay. Very good. I said, what's the average now? It's like 20 months 43 or months, I think, is the average. Really? Yeah, it's, it's gone up. up. It's up a bit. Okay. That's what the latest ANA number is. I'm bringing up the curve, though. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Very good. So I want to ask you a few, uh, kind of as an icebreaker, I'm going to throw out a few terms, uh, initiatives at J.P. Morgan Chase, and I want you to just react with whatever comes to your mind, word, phrase, feeling, emotion, whatever it might be. So I'm just going to go, and, um, and the first one I'm going to say is advancing cities. Impact. Why? Um, I think it's one of many initiatives, but it's a dramatic one that shows that the size and scale of our company can solve real world and social problems in a way that few companies can. It's not just PR. It is really having impact. Next one, new skills at work. Proud. And this is a program where you are preparing. Yeah, we were, I think, ahead of the, the curve on this one of understanding that there are People in the population, particularly a lot of young men who aren't being skilled and trained in the skills that we need today, and there will be elements of the workforce that could get left behind if we don't get actively involved in how you reskill these people. Okay. Chase my home. Faster. Why? It's we should have built it faster. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Entrepreneurs of Color Fund. Proud. Mm -hmm. Necessary. Okay. That's Mama. Hashtag that's Mama. Serena. Yeah, very A nice. great story behind that one. And the last one is customer. Obsessed. Say more about that. We're shamelessly ripping off Amazon's language because uh, they talk about customer obsession in a way that's really clarifying. I think a lot of people talk about customer service or customer experience. And we made a decision about two years ago to really shift to obsessed because as much as we talked about customer experience, we were still thinking about it from a product point of view. I want to talk about my customer for my product and not really, really re-engineering ourselves to be much more customer-centric, customer-focused, customer-obsessed, which a lot of companies talk about. It is hard to do. It sure is. So mm -hmm. what could others learn from your journey from thinking the mindset of customer experience to customer-obsessed? How What's changed within your organization and what could others learn from that? Um, yeah, there's a lot to learn, and I certainly don't know that we have cracked the code of getting it exactly right. It comes down to um, old-fashioned data and insights. I think when you think about the customer, you have to look at the real insights. Customers don't want to be treated like products. For us in particular, they don't want to be treated like an account. They know that Chase knows them, particularly because we have all of their data and they need to be shown that we care, that we have the data and that we care. And then the data just shows how many of the individual customers have each other's products, and we know that. It's unknowable in a lot of CPG companies or beauty companies. Right. We know exactly who our customers are and exactly what products they have. And when you understand that it really is one customer and your job is to have them become a customer once, 
and then deepen with them as their life progresses, it becomes a different exercise than just acquisition marketing. Yeah. So I just named a m- number of initiatives that you're, you're, they're in the market and you use very emotional words to react to them. I just read the annual letter from your CEO, Jamie Dimon, and it just, you know, it made me feel like here's an organization, it was like a manifesto Mm -hmm. to change the world, improve the world. So to me, it was very moving, provocative, comprehensive. So what is it like to be the CMO of a company with that kind of impact and potential impact where you're taking on some of the most intractable issues in our world that are not being addressed? That blows my mind. I mean, do you think about that in the morning when you get up? Does oh, that, yeah. So tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm tremendously grateful to be in this position. And when I think about what else I would want to do, I couldn't imagine another job I would want to have. In CEO jo- CMO jobs, I think I have one of the biggest. There's a lot of big jobs out there and a lot of people I really admire and great companies. Um, I think I have the best CEO to work for, potentially of our generation, forget just our category, and we have a company that makes and produces something that really matters. I'm sure I could get fired up about sneakers and things that other brands make, and I incredibly admire that work, but you know, people care a whole lot about their money, and when your brand purpose is to help people make the most of their money, it is a, a daunting and uh, incredibly exciting thing to come to work for every day. Like, I will be at this company until I feel like I'm either blocking someone or they throw me out. But I love the work. I don't fantasize about going on a beach. So it's a demanding job. Mm -hmm. How do you stay creative, fresh, vital, on top of things? You're a very uh, honest person. You're a very vulnerable person. You have a lot of your life on social media. What tips could you have for our listeners, especially our younger listeners, about how you manage your life? Yeah. You know, what are your rituals? Yeah. Well, the best thing is, like, I don't have it figured out. And I'm a big, big believer that um, oversharing your vulnerability is a healthy thing. Because I remember in this business, when I was coming up looking at a lot of a lot of the women ahead of me, and thinking first, there was like the dragon ladies of people who brag about taking red eyes and and not showing up for their kids' games and thinking, well, I'll never be that, so I'm going to opt out of this industry at some point. And then there were the women who had the blowouts and the nails and pictures of their kids everywhere where you thought, well, I'm never going to be able to have the operation figured out in the way that she does until we all admit that no one has it figured out. And some days are great and some days are super messy and, you know, I, I don't do my nails and some days I'm unprepared for a meeting because I was helping my daughter with her homework and some days I didn't help her with her homework and my husband did and you've got to keep it all in balance but admit that you can be a hot mess from time to time or more than that more often it really does come down to intense intense time management and prioritization and we sort of we all have different systems for that sure you seem to also keep a healthy sense of humor so how important is that for getting through all the ups and downs of your work, your life, everything? Yeah. As I tell people, I'm like, I'm hilarious. I can't <laughs> help it. Yeah, I, I, I take this job really seriously. I love my life. I think if I could have lived it 10 times over, there were nine other ways it could have turned out all of them worse. This was by far the best option. But I don't ever want to take myself too seriously because I know at some point my moment in the sun is over. And all of these people who want my time and attention and are inviting me to great parties will likely go away. There'll be people I'll keep with me forever, and I know who they are, too. Uh, But you really need to be grounded because this job in particular, maybe more than any other job in the company, can get intoxicating in a way that you see people uh, get too entrenched with the laughing gas a bit and you've yeah. got to you've got to remain grounded you know that yeah. you lived it yeah, you were C- probably the the golden boy for many years yeah yeah mm-hmm. i guess so my ceo <laughs> said to me though on my first day in the job as png cmo he said just be careful you will never outrun this job don't even try that's true that's great advice so make a few choices about where you will have lasting impact where you uniquely can have impact and focus on that and just everything else is less important. Do a few things well. Yeah. At the end of the year, 
people only remember about 10% of what That's you did. Right. And getting really focused about what that is. I mean, one of the things I do every week, I've got a, a pad, like a good old fashioned pad of paper mm-hmm. with quadrants in it. And one side says strategic, the other side says tactical, one says personal, and another says stuff that has to get done, which is different than tactical, just yep. crap you've got to cross off your list. But it's an important way of holding yourself accountable. Am I really focused on the strategic stuff? Are the five things that I've got to get over the line for my boss? Or am I allowing myself to get pulled into other people's time and other people's demands or other people's careers? Which is hard because I'm a giver. Like I want to help right. everybody. But but your inbox can control your outbox, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I have a very similar system. I, I've kept it for years. Uh, Stephen Covey came into P&G years ago okay. and talked about his system. And a couple things stayed with me. One is put every major role in your life and every week think about two or three things that are really critical for that role, whether it's a dad, a son, yeah. a brother, a community leader, you know, a corporate leader. And that way you just kind of keep your, your, your scope wide. Yeah. And you realize all the important roles in your life. You don't let one of them swallow up the others. So I, it's funny. I do something similar. I work with a woman named Lisa McCarthy who has a system called Lisa. Fast Forward. Yes. And she it's fabulous. Has, it's amazing. And it's actionable. She has you write a letter to yourself a year in advance with your life as you most boldly imagine it to be as if it's already happened. So I've yeah. lost 10 pounds. I've grown the credit card business by 5%. I've you know, went away with my husband for three days without you kids. You finished that renovation? You, I finished the renovation and stayed happily married. Whatever those <laughs> things are, I made, you know, I did two field trips with my kids. Mm-hmm. And then you have a system that forces you to spend your time on those things yeah. and hold yourself accountable and get a partner that holds you accountable. And it makes an unbelievable difference in not just getting consumed by the noise. Yeah. Yeah. As an aside, you know how I know her? Yeah. When I came in as CMO of P&G, we had just inked a deal with Viacom right. to spend $300 million with them. Yeah. And she was the account person over all of their properties. And she's the, one of the first people I met. She was unreal. Yep. In working across properties, yep. divisions, geographies, she was, she's a force of nature. Yeah. She's a really positive light in the she world. She is. And it's funny. She, she has a funny analogy that I remember. How often people talk about how busy they are. And how boring it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so she says, just stop doing it and, and reframe the narrative, which a lot of people teach, of just say, I'm overly fulfilled. Yeah. <laughs> so you talked about your ritual in the quadrant. Yeah. Do you, you know, tell me about your days. I mean, do you get up early to exercise or read? Yeah. I mean, how do you, what are some of the rituals you have that you think keep you you know, fresh and on top of things. Yeah, and every day is chaos. Yeah, I know. So I think I we all start yeah. with, here's my here's, intention yeah. of my ritual and forgiving yourself when you know it's all going to um, derail. I, I typically get up early, which the younger me would have just laughed at. I'm up at 525. Mm-hmm. I'm on a 630 train. I'm at the office by 715 before with coffee. Oh. FaceTime my kids. What That's before coffee? my children what wake kind of up. coffee? Starbucks. Okay. Vanilla latte with okay. two pumps. For less sugar. Um, I FaceTime the kids so I see them get ready in the morning. And then I don't book any meetings before nine if I can avoid it. And that helps me feel like I'm in control of my day. I've cleared the backlog. I've had some brain time, which is rare, to sort of set mm-hmm. how I need to spend my time that week, how I need to spend my time in particular that day, where I've got free time that I need to respond to. Uh, I do something similar on Sunday nights. I just look at the week, make sure the time's being well spent, and focus on like three big things that have to get over the line, which helps. But then, you know, I got to get home to meet with the builder because there's a gas pipe in the wall (laughs) or my daughter dislocated her knee and all of those things happen too. Yeah, Yeah. Mm -hmm. super. So I want to get into the CMO role a bit now. Yeah. This is where oh. I'm going to pick your brain, too. Okay, You're the well, one who aced it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm still a work in progress. <laughs> well, we all are, right? <laughs> but I would like to you to talk a little bit about, you know, you're the chief marketing officer of this incredible institution that's years old that is making a huge difference. What's the work? Yeah. I mean, what do you do? If you had to put it into a pie chart or buckets, I mean, yep. what do you do? Uh, I'd say it's, I don't know that I have the percentages right, but it's maybe... 25%, I mean, 
really focused on the big growth initiatives, Mm -hmm. like the big things. And there's, you know, five of them that I'm really focused on driving this year. So an example of one that you can talk about would be? uh, Ensuring that we've got alignment with uh, our, our core segments and the products that we offer among those segments, and that it's not just people individually marketing, it makes sense as a package to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Back to the idea that you should only become a customer once. Then there's a lot of, I had to kind of reframe in my head, um, there's just a chunk of my job that's solving problems, because you can get depleted during the course of a day by the number of people walking in your office and dropping grenades. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I also had to appreciate, thank God, they're coming in my office and dropping grenades instead of hiding them in a pretty box and then it blows up later. If people feel comfortable coming to me with the problem, that's a good thing. But resetting, this is my job to actually solve their problems. Right. Um, and then some of it's people. And then some of it is just responding to my senior team and partners on things they need. Yeah. So who are your most important thought partners, you know, in this life you lead or internally and externally? Yeah. Um, There's a group of people who I really rely on inside of J.P. Morgan. Um, I'm absolutely blessed that some of my best friends in the world are at that company. Uh, We're incredibly privileged that a number of the women in the biggest jobs that I interact with are not only good friends, they are women. Mm -hmm. The woman who runs the consumer bank, T. Duckett, the woman who runs the credit card business, Jen Peepsack, we're all very close friends. Our kids are around the same age. And they're the ones who I will go to to be my best, worst, messiest, most exposed Mm -hmm. self because I know they'll help me get better. Mm -hmm. My team is the best team I've ever had. I rely on them deeply. I try to be really honest with them about what I'm struggling with. I don't believe that sometimes you go into a meeting and everything's a pre-read and everything's an agenda. Right. Sometimes it's just, I'm struggling with this and I don't know the way out. Let's spitball Let's for a while. And then there's amazing people in this industry. Linda Boff is a great friend. Carolyn Everson sure. is a great friend. There's you know the Pam Kaufman from Nickelodeon. Carolyn's at Facebook. Yeah. Yep. Pam Kaufman at Nickelodeon. Ross mm-hmm. Martin at Blackbird. Sure. Like These are people who will be in my life forever. We'll have to get them on the podcast. They're all amazing. Yeah. So you said a few times in there that you solve problems. People come to you. You have meetings where we just lay it out and kind of brainstorm about how to tackle this. I call it the big messy meeting. Well, how do you create an environment where people feel okay about that? Yeah. And I I think I've needed to learn uh, some of this to talk less because when I come in and state my opinion, then everything's going to go around that. Um, but sit back, let the conversation flow, um, don't interrupt, call people out. I've really learned that some people need to be drawn out. I think this is particularly true of women and people of color, and I've spent time trying to understand why that is, but pausing the meeting and actually ensuring that somebody's going to talk more. But there's a great Jeff Bezos line where he says, you've got to debate vigorously and then commit and make your decision at the end of the meeting, not at the beginning of the meeting. Right. Uh, And I think I thought when I was younger as a leader that you had to sort of be decisive and show your point of view instead of like kick back and wait, wait to hear people out before you do. Yeah. Yeah. So do you travel much? Uh, I try to travel less. I did a no travel Mm -hmm. January. Good for you. It was the greatest. I did no travel like. I did keto. (laughs) I was trying to do everything right. Because in so, you know, in the CMO world. You can go from boondoggle to boondoggle, to conference to conference, to offsite right. to offsite, to where you do not show up at your day job, and that hence the 18-month or 43-month life cycle of a lot of people. Uh, and I don't have a job where I can do that. I have to deliver. It's a high-performance place. There's a ton of demand. And January it's very between, KPI-driven, right? Oh, yeah. it's, yes, and it's daily. Mm-hmm. But between CES and Davos, and then Jamie has a senior leaders meeting, and then February break, and some conference here and there, like you can start your year March 1st and all of a sudden you're behind. Will you do that again next January? Um, I might moderate it a bit. I just felt I had so much this year in particular I needed to get ahead, but I'd rather spend less time traveling for work and more in real life. Right. And once you've gone to a couple of these things, you know, you you can take a year off. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Right. So, um, I want you to talk a little bit about, um, I get this question all the time from young marketing people, and you've already hit this, but is there anything else you want to share 
you know, this area, this idea of balance or blending your yeah. life, your professional life, your personal life, I'm still getting it all the time. Yep. And, and I share how I've done it and strategies. I acknowledge it is a big issue. But at the end of the day, you have to love what you do. Yep. And clearly you do. Yeah. It's just coming out. Yep. So beyond just loving what you do and believing in it, any other kind of lessons or yeah. practices the, that you talk about? I mean, about? you start with the time management and yeah, the prioritization sure. yep. and all that. But you you do need, like, tactics for the hand-to-hand combat. I try not to do stuff during the week unless it's something I really, really want to go to, not something someone else wants me mm-hmm. to show up at. I'm home at 6.45 every night, so the trade-off of coming it's in big, yeah. early is that I leave early and I will work a bit when I'm at home, but not a lot. You know, Now mm-hmm. my kids are doing homework, so they'll do their homework and I'll you know, whack away at a few emails. I think it's just really focused on the doing the work that matters, not the stuff that, you know, yes, you have to outwork everybody else, but Again, people are only really going to remember the big things that you delivered and didn't deliver. Showing up at my kids' stuff that's mm-hmm. important to them. And I really try to integrate them into my job. So you get access to great experiences or events. Like, we'll pay for that. But mm-hmm. I want – they get to go see the Rangers, right? They yeah, get right. to go see the Warriors when they're in town. And so they understand a bit more what I do or at least the fun side of what I do. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, I take them on trips. Yeah. Quite a bit. They like so that. It's blending, right? Yeah. Bringing them into your life. Yeah, I but the I, but there's no secret sauce here, and yeah. no one has it figured out. So don't, for younger people, I'd say don't look up at women like me, or we we don't have it figured out. We are loving what we do and loving our lives and trying to spin the dials to make sure it all mm. lines up. And a lot of times it goes off the rails one way or the other. Right. And you have to be okay with that. Right? You have to be okay with that. You yeah. have to be okay with it at work, too. Yes, for a while, if for it like sure. went off the rails personally, I'm like, that was bad. Let me reset. Like Sometimes I'm not going to nail it at work because yeah. I needed to do something and, in my and life. you have to be okay with that. Yeah. You just have to. Yeah. So. How did you do it? Turn the tables on you. Uh, <laughs> how did I sort of blend or yeah. balance things? Yeah. A lot of the same things you did. Um, I developed my own rituals. You know, I, I made sure I ate right. That's a big By one. By and large, kept my energy level right. I exercised uh, nearly every morning, even if it was 20 minutes. I mean, I'd rather have I'd do it 45, but the morning was important to me, and I continue that. Um, I tried to, everything you did, Sunday night, every day, have some quiet time up front, think about where I'm going to get involved. I did have sort of also a look at my year, yeah, personally and professionally. You know, what are the times I really want to block out that are important for events with family, vacations, whatever it might be? And what are the business times where I, you know, I say to my family, I'm going to Asia for three weeks because I need to hit 10 markets. And, uh, and you know, that's it's, – but if you get in front of it and you yeah. plan, you don't miss important stuff. That's true. You don't. You write about the physical piece of it. I think yeah. that's something that people don't figure out till later because when you're younger, your body can yep. take more. Yep. But when you look at our schedules, think of a, an – an athlete at the highest level and in the jobs that we're in you're an athlete at the highest level yep. you need to have a real physical stamina program to be able to do absolutely. that absolutely and sleep yep we sometimes overlook that ariana's talked about that a lot she's there's on more my and case more and more data about that yep she's on my case about it a lot but i did learn from her like you have to set a time to go to bed not just a time to wake right. up right and you'll blow through it but if you know i got to be in bed by 9 30 if i'm going to wake up at 5 30 yep. yep. it's a different mindset yeah absolutely yeah. So your five and a half years as CMO, mm-hmm. when you came into it, did you feel prepared? No. No. God, I hope no one does. Now when you look back at it, you know, what are the new – how are you different? What are the new skills yeah. or approach to life in your business that you've developed in it those five It was interesting because when, when – um, this was a newly created job – two years before I got it. And uh, they brought in an outside candidate. And at the time, I was angry. I thought I should have had the job and, you know, got all fussed about it. And when I look back on it, it actually was one of those moments in your career where a bad thing happens that ultimately turns out to Mm -hmm. be a good thing. A lot of those. um, Because I really wasn't ready. I really wasn't. I needed two more years to learn the business and build the relationships that were going to make me successful. I still had a ton to learn when I got there. And then at the time, my father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which is a monster of a disease. And we ultimately lost that battle. But I was there. 
Uh, I was there during the year and a half that he was sick. And I don't think I could have been either as committed to the job or committed to going to every chemo session with him had that happened at the time. So when I did get the job, I was just enormously grateful. I, I had had that period of my life happen in the way I think it needed to for me and um, was able to focus my energy in learning the business, the new things that I needed to take on. And I remember when Jamie sat me down and was like giving me the job, he sort of looked kind of scared actually. And he said, this is uh, very different than what you're used to because as a communications person, you're used to making the subjective call. You have to rely on your judgment entirely to make a split second decision quickly and ask no one on behalf of the company. And he said, you're going to have to shift your headset to being around analytics, data, partnership, KPI performance. And he was crystallizing what was happening to CMOs at the time, which is yeah, you don't get to be the almighty call on casting and mm -hmm. she should wear a red shirt, not a blue shirt. And, you know, you're Svengali spinning up ingenious things. It really is much more about the customer telling you what to do. Yeah. So when he laid that out for you, did you learn that on the job? Did you do anything yeah. to accelerate your capability in those areas? Yeah. Um, I had to learn not just really how to do the math behind some of the decisions, because I didn't come up as a consumer marketer. Right. Um, I, the technology piece was the one I think that stunned me the most of how much I had to deeply understand my tech stack and how to operationalize that was going to be the key to everything. Mm -hmm. The whole point of shifting from product to customer is right. actually a tech job yeah. of driving personalization at scale. Um, so I spent a lot of time with people in the industry who knew this well, who could teach me. I did go to some conferences early on to sure. figure out if I could learn. Um, but ultimately, you end up learning from people. And Which you have partners to find were most important for you to develop your fluency um, in your strategy? Uh, I have a CTO who's, mm -hmm. I, like I call Yoda. I would be hopeless without him. But outside the company, I, I, I learn a lot from Ben Lair. Yeah, uh, sure. I learn a lot from Gary Vee. I learn a lot from David Droga. Mm -hmm. um, we have an amazing team. I learn a lot from people like you, Jim. I read your mm -hmm. book. I remember thought, Thank oh, my you. God, how did this guy have it figured out? I'm never going to have it figured out. No, and here didn't. we are. <laughs> you just had to put it in a book, right? <laughs> it looks all figured yeah. out in a book, but it's not. It's messy. Um, and you have to sort of, uh, Lindsay Vaughn says this, stay humble, stay hungry. And it's constant. Yep. Like even now, it's you're, I'm, con I'm now AI, machine learning, how to build model-driven personalization decision engines. It's very different than the skills we all came up with. Right. So I want you to tell me, this is an impossible question. Good. Five and a half years, what was your best day on the job? My best day on the job? You know what? It was maybe, There's there's been a number of them, but I think it was when Jamie asked me and his chief of staff, Judy Miller, to take over his senior leadership meeting and it was because we were complaining about it. Like it had gotten to, and I was like, thank God I didn't yeah. complain about the cafeteria <laughs> that day. And it maybe was when, it might have even been this last one. It was either this last one or the one before where you realize the power of that meeting is actually getting the top 250 people at this company, the people who are running the place, including Jamie, aligned on a strategy. So it's not just a boondoggle or sure. entertainment. It's really getting aligned on the strategy and feeling like we did that. Mm -hmm. And having him acknowledge it because a great day in marketing is a great day in marketing. I right. love it. But a great day where you feel like you are helping run the company is a whole next level thing. Yeah, fantastic. Great story. Yeah. You're an optimistic person. Is there a worse day you've had? Um, yeah, it feels like there's a lot of worse days. You know, the worst days... Like there was, there was, I don't know that it was one in particular, but certainly my dark days on the job was when we had spent two or three years trying to drive personalization and it was my personal initiative and I'd made a lot of noise and gotten a lot of people on board. Uh, and it was the day I realized we were going to fail that time around. We'd picked the wrong tech provider. We had the wrong people mm -hmm. in the job, like up and down. We had the wrong person doing tech. We had the wrong person managing it. Or at least I didn't understand yeah, deeply oh enough yeah. that I had been easily led down the wrong path. And I kind of had to go admit I had bombed this time around and reset and hold people accountable to to make it happen. It was right before Christmas. So it was like all those yeah. Yeah. all those moments. But 
you know, it, looking back on it, wouldn't be where we are now, wouldn't have the team I have on the ground, wouldn't have pounded the table to get the right tech guy there, yeah. and you, you grow into it. Yeah. Those, those, yeah. Those tough moments. But, you know, I mean, there's like, there have been others. 2008 was no, I mean, I wasn't CMO then, but that was no day at the beach. Right. The whale was not yeah. fun. I mean, there have been many sort of dark corporate days. Sure as opposed to dark personal days. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So last question about the CMO job. You know, after you pass this on someday to your successor, yep. what do you want people to say about you? Yeah. You know, I think I want them to say she made the, the company wouldn't be what it is without her. Not just marketing wouldn't or mm -hmm. she inspired people or – that's all part of something. That's all part of the company wouldn't be the same if this one person wasn't mm -hmm. there. Steve Burke actually has a great speech about how mm -hmm. one person can make such a difference in the company. And he talks about Frank Wells at Disney and when he died. Mm -hmm. Satya so at many, Microsoft right now. Exactly. And I, I would like to be thought of as one of those people. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah, my last day or when I announced I was leaving p and I had like 40 calls to make before anything broke publicly. And I, I called Dan Wyden, who was a really interesting partner, yep. head to Wyden Kennedy, and it was silence on the phone. And I said, Dan? And he said, no, you can't go. He said, you are P&G. So I thought, well, it was very touching, but yeah. you know, but that's the that's sorts of things want. we want to hear, exactly. Well, and the beauty we were in of- it for the right reasons. The beauty of the CMO job now is you're, you're not boxed in. No, it's um, wide open. Because it's now becoming customer experience and culture. You know, I, I manage part of AI and machine learning for our company. It's employee experience. It's technology. It's operations. It's product. Your your boundaries are unlimited if you can lean into that in a constructive way. Because obviously there are other people who have domains that that sit outside of your direct control. But it's an incredibly exciting time to be in the job if that doesn't scare you. So Kristen, I want you to share with me something that I could never find about you online on the internet. You're pretty out there, right? You're pretty <laughs> active on Twitter yep. and social media, so I know a lot, a lot about you from that. But what's the one or two things I would not find? But you wouldn't find in the internet. Um, so I got kicked out of Girl Scouts when I was younger because I sneaked into the boys' bathroom to see what a urinal looked like. <laughs> well, good for <laughs> like you. Curiosity, after right? School. It's important for our roles. No one was there. I thought it was like the punishment did not fit the crime. And I've since gotten to know Sylvia Acevedo, who runs Girl Scouts today, who's amazing yeah. and done amazing things with that organization. And I have told her that story, and she and I laugh about it. I think that's a deep, dark so secret. So were you disappointed when you saw the urinal? Uh, a, a little bit, yeah. yeah. I, I was still trying to figure out how it works. Yeah. <laughs> well, my dirty secret is I got expelled, or no, suspended, not expelled. Do got, tell. From Catholic school as a, like a third or fourth grader because I developed a side hustle on renting outrageous ties because we had to wear ties to school. Yep. So rather than the simple blue one, I had all these wild ones. Oh my God, your from, early from expression these, of from individuality. From these old guys in the neighborhood, <laughs> these old like 40s ties. <clears throat> so I started this trend where everyone was wearing these crazy wide 40 ties. And they said, and he's taking money for that? So I called to the Monsignor and I got nailed, sent home, called my parents, suspended. What did your parents say? For a side say? hustle. Did they? Are they... You know, Did they have your back? I think or? they were just, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. They were, I think they were just trying to hide the laughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, it's not on the wow. internet. So, anyway. Did you wear those ties? Did you, were you of course a wild I tie did. guy? Wild, of course I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized how much people loved it. So I said, well, everyone wants to wear these. So it became a movement, right? Yeah. It's interesting. I wish it's I still had them. I think men now have more opportunity to express their creativity yeah. in their wardrobe. And we were very That's entrepreneurial. Um, it's now the my, socks. My, socks are all the thing. My friend, I know. My friends <laughs> and I knocked on the doors of old guys in the neighborhood who had these ties in their closet. So they gave us their old ties. Wow. So very low cost of goods. <laughs> <laughs> cost of goods sold. Zero. <laughs> so, all right. I want to flip into some discussion about important questions in our okay. industry, some light. All these questions you've asked me haven't been important. They've all Girl been important, Scout, but it's been more story about you. Is we're gonna, riveting. We're going to kind of <laughs> helicopter up and talk about 
some interesting questions in our industry. And the first one is one that's near and dear to my heart, and that's brand purpose. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? You know, I think some people thought it was fluffy, a fad, but it's the number one word yep. in the marketer's vocabulary, according to the ANA, the Big Trade Association. So what, what do you think brands can really do now that it's out there, everyone's trying it? How can they differentiate on it? Yeah, I think it's huge, right? Of course, you were the godfather of this. But, uh, you know, our brand purpose is to help people make the most of their money uh, and to help America become more financially healthy. And I think it's becoming more it's critical purpose. because I th originally brand purpose was the anchor for a lot of your advertising and your content and the marketing product. It's now becoming critical to how you run the company. Like most companies, we're going through a transition where we are trying to become much more of an e-commerce company. We want more direct mm -hmm. sales off of our channels instead of having to go through our intermediaries, our Google or affiliates or, or sure. other things other than our own stores and our own channels. And the only way we're really going to win that is by the customer understanding the brand and differentiating in their decision if your product is inherently commoditized. And in so, if you're not able to influence the consumer through traditional advertising, which is changing like no other time, they have to deeply understand the brand purpose in the product. Yeah. So where are the gaps now? What would you like to see in the industry yeah. or for your own company to advance brand purpose to purpose 3.0? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest change in the industry now is uh, with the shift from consumers to linear to digital media, um, the mistake marketers have made is assuming that the interruptive form of an ad, which a consumer will accept in linear TV as the trade-off for the free entertainment experience is not the consumer that's in a digital active state and is one tap away from an infinite amount of content. And so instead, we are interpreting brand purpose through advertising that the consumer is now seeing as a tax on their time. And that model has to change. It has to be much more about how the consumer can discover your mm -hmm. product or service or brand and relate to the why you're doing it, not just why you want to sell it. Yeah. So moving on from purpose, I want to talk about lifestyle brands. So Peloton, Orange Theory, Nike, Target, BMW, you know, they're brands that have become sort of a lifestyle. When you say them, something comes to mind very, very vividly. So how do brands do that, and when does that happen? Yeah. Well, I can talk a little bit about our experience with the Sapphire brand. Sure. Because yep. that's – we've watched that brand co come from a credit card brand to James be Corden is sort of your spokesperson. He is. That, right? I know that contract has expired, okay. and he's but now has been. with con um, coffee. He was, yeah. Um, but we've seen that brand move from just a, a strong credit card brand to something that is becoming much more like a lifestyle brand. Mm -hmm. And our gateway into that is that it's a, a travel product. Right, right. Um, but it has come to mean something more than that. It's not your dad's card. Uh, it's um, the card for people who like to discover things. And so we have all of these things. What is Sapphire? What isn't it? It's a community, not a club. Uh, it's um, not ostentatious. It's uh, you know, for people who like to go to an Airbnb and eat in a hole in the wall. Mm -hmm. And it, in that, it changed our marketing play because we put everything into that product launch into the product. So we had a high premium, high rewards value, and um, uh, no committed advertising behind it. We just dropped it in the market and didn't say anything about it. And the blogs picked it up mm -hmm. and then Refer a Friend picked it up. And all of a sudden, this came the thing. This became the thing that you had if you were in the know. But it was the first time we sort of threw everything into the product design itself, and then let the market take care of itself. So the lesson on it would be that you designed an incredible product. Design a badass product. You understood product. your customers really, really deeply. Yep. And the importance of travel and experiences. And then you got behind. You just let the people who loved it. Do yeah. Your, the key consumer insight was millennials want experiences, not stuff. Right. 
Right. And then you build a product around that and you let the product sell itself. Yeah, it's a beautiful you story. Know, consumers don't like to be interrupted. They don't like to be told what to buy. And the best lifestyle brands can deliver that. Yeah, yeah. So I want to talk about talent and athletes, uh, musicians, actors, you know. And how do you decide how to align talent with your brand? Yeah, um, it's hard. Mm-hmm. But we, um, on athletes, we align it to our sports and entertainment strategy, which is around arenas that can deliver both the paid media visibility and money can't buy type of experiences for the wholesale clients, for the high net worth clients. And uh, then we align with the key athlete for that property, because if we're going to sign up to partner with the Golden State Warriors and Steph Curry goes and does a deal with a competitor, we've just diluted our equity. The same is true with the US Open and Serena Williams. And we pick athletes that align not only with the brand and the brand values, but really care about the mission. We will not hire another athlete or actor or celebrity who does not believe in the purpose of helping people make the most of their money. Mm -hmm. The fascinating one was when Kevin Hart reached out to us and said, I've got a story about money and I care and I really want to help people with their financial health and the way I've helped them with their physical health because he has a whole brand around Mm -hmm. physical fitness. And so we sat down and had a number of conversations about how to get Kevin involved around the purpose, not will you sell our cash back card? It was what's the whole full relationship? And that meant a lot. Yeah. I noticed you tweeted how beautiful the Dwayne Wade tribute was that Budweiser did. It doesn't Mm -hmm. get much better than that. It was yeah, a beautiful. It, it brings the principles you just talked about to life. That was a, that was a beautiful piece of work. It's rare that you can do that, where you can really, I guess, get to the essence of who that athlete is, because all of these athletes and celebrities don't want to be known for being just an actor or just an athlete. The best ones deeply understand their brand and want to align with brands that they can co-create with. Yeah. And the Dwayne Wade spot was a perfect example of that. Yeah. It just showed who he is. Absolutely. So jumping to the Super Bowl, it's still in our industry the pinnacle of advertising. I wouldn't say marketing, but advertising. Mm-hmm. I've never done one. You've never done a Super not Bowl in spot? This, not in this, ad, in this job, no. Oh, wow. That surprises mm-hmm. me. Why not? You know, we probably I, – I don't know that it was purposeful. We weren't mm-hmm. anti-Super Bowl. We, we did, it didn't fit with the business need of the time. We weren't doing a product launch or yeah. anything that really aligned to it. I'm all for it. If it aligns to a strategy. But I think there are people who just do it to say they've done it and do it in a gimmicky way. And we really had to be sure we it wasn't us talking to ourselves, right? It's like the Con Lion thing. That's amazing. It's a great honor. Do it because the work works, right. not because you want no, absolutely. one. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. When we did our first Super Bowl ad at P&G, I actually ran a contest. Did you? And I said, whoever is the best creative, I'll pay for it corporately. That's smart. So I had like 25 brands. That's early crowdsourcing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and we had all this great stuff. And the brands that didn't get number one, they did it anyway. They did yeah. the work. And then we had a big reveal. We had a big meeting to reveal all the ideas. We made a lot of fun out of it, made a competition, and it just elevated everything. That's a great idea. And that's how we used it in the early days anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. so what's your favorite Super Bowl ad of all time? You know, the one that sticks with me, because there have been so many that are, you know, could be feature films. They're gorgeous. But the one that really hit me was the HQ ad two years ago. Do you remember this ad? Say more. It was a 15. Yeah. And it was in the fourth quarter. So the cheapest of all buys. But the fourth quarter, it happened to be the Patriots Atlanta game. I'm a big Patriots yeah. fan. Oh, yeah. And that was maybe right. one of the most exciting quarters yeah. in any Best comeback Super ever. Bowl mm-hmm. ever, particularly if you're a Patriots fan. And they bought a 15 and they ran um, a user generated piece of a woman winning HQ. And she loses her mind. Yeah. And she's won $11. And they took 15 minutes of that moment and just let it play. I, I saw it. It went, it went viral of her losing her mind, winning $11. And then it went quiet and it just had the HQ logo at the end. And Good so what I them. liked about it was it was cheap and it was incredibly effective. And it broke through this higher order purpose-driven, deeply emotional thing that ultimately became noise, and the cheap thing was the thing that stuck yeah. out. Very customer-centric, too, right? Exactly. They knew their audience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Great example. So... They I got lucky. Talk, yeah, they got... <laughs> well, game. there was an insight behind it. They, yeah. You know, they knew what they were doing. So I want to broaden now to talk about marketing versus versus advertising. 
What are some mar- one marketing campaign or a few that you have not done that have kind of blown your mind? And you said, wow. We talked about Budweiser. Yeah, the, just the Kaepernick campaign. Yeah, the Kaepernick. Say more. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's everything that Nike does. I mean, they, there was a spot that I, I posted on Twitter. You saw it mm-hmm. of a athlete that had cerebral palsy yep. that ran a race again, all user generated, real, not user generated, it was real content. And then Nike gives them a contract at the end. Um, I thought what was so fascinating about the Nike Kaepernick campaign, they really knew their consumer. Um, it's hard to take risks like that. It's hard to take risks like that in any brand, particularly you know brands mm-hmm. like ours. But they deeply understood, I think, their consumer and and how people would react. And while there was a lot of talk in the industry about that ad, and um, it got a lot of attention, it drove sales because they understood their consumers so clearly, and because equality was such a core part of their value proposition and the athletes they represent, and they had defined what equality meant to them. So you're, I see you on social media about gun rights, Mm -hmm. and I see you on social media about poverty. Mm -hmm. Why are those so important for you? Uh, The gun safety thing is a very long story, but it, um, it, there are two things. One, after Newtown happened, my children were an hour away from that school. They were six and four at the time, and it hit me that moment that this wasn't something that happened to other people who lived out west or in different places that that could have been my child and I ended up the chairman of the board of this Sandy Hook Promise of the families that formed an organization after that tragedy and they dedicated their life to this cause and I thought god can't we just get there on empathy alone do you have to wait until someone in your family is shot and then I started to learn more about it this is a personal cause for me. This is not a, know, a, a business cause. And it's uh, it's something that marketers have a skill that can contribute to bridging a false binary argument of are you for or against or are you this or that. It's not about that. It's mm-hmm. just about saving lives. And people will approach it from different ways. Of, is it about you know safe storage? Is it about different cultural phenomena? Is it about suicide prevention? But can we all get aligned on a higher order of saving lives? And can we take the skills that we have as marketers and instead of selling things, help bridge an unnecessarily binary narrative and a lot of misinformation that goes out there? So I felt passionate about it from two fronts that I thought, I'd love to cure pancreatic cancer, right? It killed my father. It kills people, brilliant people, people every year. Uh, I can't. But I do know how to shape a narrative, and so that was uh, mm-hmm. that was important to me. And on the poverty piece, again, it's a it's a solvable problem. Um, it's a problem that business has a real role to play in solving, and it's a it's a problem that our brand has a role to play because when it comes down to uh, financial equality, the path out of poverty and and inequality of any kind is often money sure. and helping people with their money. Yeah, beautiful. So I have a lightning round for you at the end. Okay. So if we can go through this. Yeah. I want you to tell me your favorite non-JP Morgan Chase brand, a brand that you cannot live without. Uh, Sakara. So, why? It's a home delivery, yeah. uh, plant-based food. Yeah. So to your yeah. point about the food being yeah. important fuel, they are, I met the founder at a conference and I'm do you addicted. Have, do you use it every week? Oh, yeah. Super. Mm-hmm. So are you reading any books now? I just finished Factfulness, um, which is an amazing book. It also talks about the for and against and how yeah. the world is getting better. So if you're an optimist and mm-hmm. you're sort of depressed by the state of the world, you should pick up that book. And then I'm going to, I think, either read David Kidder's new book, New to Big. Yeah, I just finished it. It's um, great. Or some type of guilty pleasure because I'm going to Miami next week. All right. <laughs> Sitting for at you. Beach. Yes. Right, read both. So one on the plane, one when you're there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So is, are you watching any series now that you love? Um, as anyone who knows me, I was not a Game of Thrones person. And then in the past whatever, since season seven ended, I've watched them all. My rule was I could only watch them when I was on the treadmill. So right. I've now yep. watched, because who's going to watch 80 right. hours of TV? Right. But if I can watch 80 hours of TV and I look forward yep. to watching a whole episode on the treadmill. So I'm caught up. 
And I'm freaking out about season eight coming Here it on. Comes. Here it comes. A- and then I'm going to miss actually the first one because I'm. At Have you Coachella. bought the Oreos? Talking about dying the Oreos, Game of Thrones. No, Special no, edition? but I, like the where is the throne? And I use the analogy all the time when people are doing corporate infighting. I'm like, you're like the Lannisters and the Starks and the Targaryens and the army of the dead is it's at the new wall. Language. <laughs> <laughs> and half the time people will nod and the other half will be like, what is she talking I'm about? I'm watching Patriot now. It's so quirky, so dark, so good. Well, after Game of Thrones, I had to watch The Crown because I like yeah, needed something else yeah. after that. And yeah. that was also amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So favorite fit class or fitness activity? Um, I can say I got a mirror. Do you like to run? I, I, no. I, no, because my knees are kind of given out. So but you, you I do classes. Um, I I do the mirror. I have um, classes on my iPad. And the great yeah. thing about the mirror is you can do it at home. You can do yoga. Yeah. You can do boxing. You can do anything. So yeah. it's kind of fun. All right. Any podcasts that you're listening to now? Yours. Very. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. We appreciate <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. First Everybody episode is going to be great. Watch. It's really compelling. <laughs> and finally, the biggest. You've said a lot about your passions over the last hour. Your your biggest passion in the world right now. Uh, it's my kids. Yeah. Making sure I get that right. You realize they're 12 and 10 now, that it's, a, it's not that big a window of time that they're under my care and I'm shaping to the best I can. Mine are I grown can. up, and I'm, where'd that go? Well, it's, I've now started where'd to sort go? of say she's out of the house in five and a half years. Like that, and you know, to me, she's still a little girl. So them, the Boston Red Sox, and um, you know, trying to have a positive impact on the world. <laughs> Beautiful, Kristen. Thank you for being a guest on the CMO Podcast. It has been wonderful. Thank you, Jim. 